Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about something that makes every Indian's heart swell with pride. The amazing rise of Indian origin CEOs in global companies and all walks of life abroad. We have got Sundar Pichai at Google, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, Shantanu Narayan at Adobe, Arvind Krishna at IBM, Ajay Banga at the World Bank, Sanjay Mehrotra at Micron Technology and Anjali Sood at Vimeo. This raises a serious question, why do Indians succeed and thrive abroad but not in their own country? India is the world's largest exporter of high net worth individuals and skilled professionals to English speaking OECD countries. Between 2021 and this year, 3.6 lakh citizens emigrated abroad. This, however, isn't a new phenomenon. For the past seven decades, India has experienced a steady exodus of talent. The Indian diaspora has grown to estimated 32 million, with members gaining prominent positions in politics, business, and academia in the Western world. So why do Indians succeed globally, but not in their own country? Some argue that India has tripled food production and the middle class has expanded to 430 million. But one must view national progress not from where we were, but where we are, in relation to progress of other countries, especially in our neighborhood. For instance, much was made of India becoming the fifth large economy in terms of GDP, pushing colonizer Great Britain to the sixth rank. But Britain's population is 1 20th of India's and its per capita GDP is $47,200 compared to India's $2,600. The plain truth is that India's development track record since independence has been dismal. This might sound unbelievable today, but in 1949, we were ahead of China in terms of national development metrics. India had a well-developed industrial base with pioneer industrialists like G.D. Birla, J.R.D. Tata, Walchand, Hirachand, Lala Sriram, Kastur Bhai, Lal Bhai, and Ambalal Sarabhai. Yet the newly independent nation was shunted onto the broad highway of socialism. This led to Indian pioneer industrialists who were poised to conquer Asian markets and provide affordable goods and services to the population being branded blood-sucking capitalists. Government tax revenues and public savings were pumped into capital-intensive public sector enterprises which averaged a return of 1-3% to on investment. Simultaneously, private sector enterprises were not permitted to expand causing loss of excise, income and sales tax revenue to the government. The funds that could have helped public education, healthcare and nutrition on a massive scale were directed to the bleeding PSEs. The economy was trapped between a rock and a hard place with negligible return on investment in capital intensive PSEs and stalled private sector growth. As early as 1960s, lack of opportunities, employment and social upward mobility became difficult for citizens, prompting steady migration of people from India to destinations overseas. Middle class migrants with education and marketable skills went to the US, UK and Commonwealth countries, while less qualified and unskilled skilled laborers mass migrated to Arab Gulf countries where they endured arduous and often humiliating work condition. Over the decades, the number of people of Indian origin migration to foreign countries has multiplied, raising the question about why PIOs succeed outside but not in their country of birth. Dr. Dipankar Gupta views this continuous wealth and talent drain with surprising equanimity. Comparing the brain drain outflow of better and more ambitious individuals with the internal migrants moving from rural to prosperous and innovative urban India to improve their livelihood and prospects. But this analogy begs the question why India did not become the sufficiently prosperous and innovative to retain talent and professionals. The answer is rooted in a disastrous left ideological turn after independence. Jawaharlal Nehru, the leader of Congress party and India's first prime minister, resolved to transform India, a subcontinent with several millennia of private enterprise tradition, into socialist pattern of society. He suppressed private sector and promoted massive public sector enterprises or PACs managed by risk averse bureaucrats and clerks. These PACs, funded by Soviet-style five-year plans or Panchavarshi Yojana, proved to be a disaster. 
The return on the investment of over 350 major PSE averaged 1 to 3% for almost three decades. Nehru's left lurch was aggravated by his daughter Indira Nehru Gandhi, who nationalized 28 major banks, general insurance companies, and for a while, the food grain trade. Unsurprisingly, India's GDP growth rate averaged rock bottom 3.5% per year for over three decades. Indra Gandhi was succeeded by Rajiv Gandhi, who, like his mother, was also assassinated in 1991. Rajiv Gandhi's successor, P. V. Narsimha Rao, emerged as post-independent India's first non-socialist prime minister. He abolished the industrial licensing system, monopolies, legislation, and reservation of production of a large number of consumer products by small-scale sector companies. The Indian economy leaped out of 3.5% per year GDP growth mire and onto the 5% plus orbit. This growth continued under the leadership of Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpayee. However, the Congress party's surprise return to power at the center in 2004 led to rampant corruption and secession of the educated middle class from 21st century India. Persistence with state-led development in India has led to widespread corruption within the economy. This is a stifled enterprise and foreign investment and the economic reforms of 1992 have not been carried forward to their natural conclusion. Under the BJP, the annual GDP growth averaged 5-6% to per year, but the Neta Babu Brotherhood is reluctant to get off the back of the Indian economy. The liberalization and deregulation initiatives of 1991 has transformed into two step forward and one step back. Consequently, India ranked 63 on the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Global Index in 2022, way below China's ranking of 31. A damaging outcome of the endemic corruption is the near collapse of law and order and justice system, a major but unidentified cause of the brain drain from India. India's ratio of police civilian population at 144 is to 1 lakh pales in comparison to other countries and is way below the UN recommendation norm of 222. The majority of India's police is perceived to be corrupt with only 25% of the population reposing trust in law and order maintenance personnel. The national and judicial backlog has risen to 56 million cases with cases taking 10 to 15 years for final adjudication. With neither security nor speedy justice, it's no surprise that the high net worth and talented professionals are leaving the country. Yet perhaps the most egregious error of post-independence India's Soviet-style centrally planned economy has been the neglect of public education. Poor quality of education is intimately connected with the deficiencies of political, socio-economic, law and order systems. Government schools in rural India, which constitutes to grudgingly host 65% of the country's 1.4 billion population, have very poor learning outcomes as repeatedly highlighted by the annual ASER surveys conducted by the highly respected Pratham Education Foundation. Over half of the children in class 7 are not able to read and comprehend class 3 textbooks or manage simple computation sums. Moreover, the government or public schools suffer pathetically inadequate infrastructure and widespread teacher absenteeism. Higher education institutions in India are only marginally better. As per a study by the Aspiring Mind, a Delhi-based talent recruitment company, 70% of engineering college graduates and 80% of arts, science and commerce graduates are unemployable in Indian and foreign multinational companies. India's 1074 university, some established over 150 years ago, also suffer from poor conditions. As per the latest Times of Higher Education League table, India's top-ranked varsities, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, is ranked in the 250 to 300 band. The cutthroat competition to crack the world's toughest test the IIT JEE has spawned an entire 10,000 crore private tutorial industry. India's lopsided higher education system, defined by a few high-quality universities, surrounded by a sea of mediocre institutions, 
prompt over 100,000 graduates and school leavers migrate to universities abroad every year. The number of the Indian students in higher education institutions abroad is estimated at 1.3 million. Social scientist Shivishwanathan attributes to the mediocritization of Indian higher education to a loss of appetite for research and innovation and contempt with competence replication within the academy. Indian science is dying of boredom and the Indian industry is becoming increasingly bureaucratic and risk averse. He says, unsurprisingly, the majority of the Indian students who venture abroad for study in foreign universities don't return. It should also be noted that the majority of the students in India's higher education institutions are middle class. In both major political parties, BJP and Congress, there are pro-business leaders who need public support. However, there's little support for private enterprise within academia and media. The Congress party doesn't seem to have learned a lesson after a disastrous with Neta Babu socialism. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi continues to bash big businesses, oblivious to the reality that India needs a thousand Adanis and Ambanis to attend annual double-digit GDP growth rates to make up for the lost decades between 1947 and 1991. Meanwhile, the middle class, especially the intelligentsia, needs to discover ways to eradicate public sector corruption and clean up the law and order machinery and justice delivery system. Capital flight and the brain drain will not stop without these reforms, especially since OECD countries are rapidly shedding their centuries-old racial and color prejudices and sweeping up the best entrepreneurs and professionals from the developing countries. India's establishment leaders are not alive to see the pathetic condition of government schools and higher education institutions. For India's unambitious business leaders, the country's 430 million strong middle class market is sufficiently large within which to do business. The plain truth is that the Indian economy is facing significant drain of wealth and talent due to the continuous emigration of its brightest citizens. Akhil Pahal, an economics and business management alum, believes that uplifting education is the most effective catalyst for progressive development. Although data suggests that the outflow of wealth creators and professionals from India to OECD countries seems to be swelling, some young professionals believe that the inflow of immigrants back to India is also increasing. But this optimism is like clutching straws in a storm. An alarmingly large number of successful businessmen and highly qualified professionals who should be generating wealth contributing to India's national development are migrating abroad. The approach of the academics and the establishment to this phenomena is tantamount to grave dereliction of duty and responsibility. Conditions have to be created within the country to retain enterprising high potential citizens. To this end, the first bold national initiative should be to accord the highest priority to education and human capital development, a subject that has been kept on the back burner for far too long. If you like this video, please share it with your friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe to India's first and only education-focused magazine, Education World's YouTube channel to get more insightful content. See you in the next episode.